Hello. Um, there are many, have been many famous um, and brilliant TED Talks that have focused on the fact that there are relatively few women at the top of most organisations and around the world. And to be honest, at this point, I don't think we probably want to talk about it much more than to actually see some evidence of real change. And so I come with some exciting news. I want to share some real results of something that's happened in this country, in the UK, in the past few years. I want to talk about the approach that's led to those uh, results and also why I believe that the learnings from them can be used to encourage not just more women, but people from other underrepresented groups as well to both fulfill their career, but do so in a way that means they can be true to themselves as well as making our businesses better. Now, the 30% Club was launched in November 2010 with the quite simplistic but rather ambitious aim of seeing um, at least 30% of board directorships on Britain's largest 100 companies, the FTSE, being woman, women by the end of 2015. At the time, just 12.5% of those directorships were held by women. There were 21 all-male boards. And then if you looked at the next 250 biggest companies listed in this country, actually over half of them had women-free boards, so to speak. And more to the point, there hadn't been any real change in, in those numbers in the preceding few years. Now, if you fast forward just four years, I've only got one slide, but it's an important one, um, and that 12.5% has almost doubled to 23%. There are now no all-male boards in the FTSE, and you can imagine just how fierce the competition was not to be that very last one. And then if you look at the um, next 250 companies, then there's been a really dramatic change. So we've gone from 131 all-male boards to just 24. What's important is this being achieved not through a mandatory quota or any kind of legislation, but from businesses doing it for themselves. Now, the, um, uh, I want to take you back into how the 30% Club sort of came about because, you know, what's really driven the change here has been business leaders, most of whom, of course, are men, driving the change. And what's happened really has been an amazing shift in the mindset because of their involvement so that this isn't seen so much as a diversity or a special interest issue anymore, but it's seen as a mainstream business issue and actually something, therefore, that is everybody's problem, not just women's problem. And that actually has been a fundamental change in obviously just such a short space of time. And because it has been driven mostly by men, of course, this is, to borrow Emma Watson's phrase, a great example of he for she in action. And I think it's just the tip of the iceberg. I think that what we've seen has triggered a sort of process whereby people are realizing, businesses are realizing, that actually we need and want bigger change. It's within our grasp, and that we're going to see change beyond the boardroom and beyond just gender. So back to how it all came about. Um, now, I started my career believing, now I realize naively, that the world of work was a world of equal opportunity. I thought how hard we worked and our ability would determine how far we could go. So, of course, I was very disappointed to realise uh, that actually my gender was an issue. And in my case, it was pretty overt. I had my first child when I was 25, and I came back from maternity leave. And, of course, at 25, this was, you know, the first promotion was uh, within my sights, um, and it was the very first rung on the ladder. But I didn't get it, and I asked my boss, you know, what should I do differently? What was wrong? And he said, well, you know, nothing really. It's just that you just had a baby, and there's some doubt over your commitment. So, um, what did I do? Well, I was the only woman in a team of 16 bond fund managers, and although the term hadn't been invented then, in effect, I leaned in big time. Um, after a couple of years, I left and joined a smaller, more entrepreneurial firm. I took every opportunity that came my way. I worked really hard. I sat at every table and invited myself when I wasn't always invited. Um, I also had more children, and uh, the juggling act was made a bit easier, or a lot easier in my case, by um, when my husband, who was a journalist, suggesting that he go freelance when we had our fourth child. Then, when I was 35, and we had five children, um, it was a pretty intense time. Uh, the youngest three had just had their third, second, and first birthdays, respectively. Um, I was offered the wholly unexpected opportunity to become the company's chief executive officer. Now, I joined this company seven years beforehand in a very junior role. I had no business training, no management experience, and at the time, the company ran £20 billion. So this wasn't so much leaning in as diving in headfirst, and it's not exactly an approach I would necessarily advocate. I learned very quickly just simply by making so many mistakes. I had to. 
learn, that is. Um, now, of course, the good news is I'm still here, and my husband and I now have actually nine children. Um, they're aged between five and 23. Uh, we have six girls and three boys. Now, to be honest, I've been quite lucky with my choices. Obviously, I have a fantastic husband, very important part of this, um, but also um, by choosing fund management or falling into fund management really is my chosen career because it's a career where the results, the performance of both of your funds when you're managing money, but then also the results from the business when you're managing the business, speak for themselves. It's not a question of how many hours you are at your desk. And of course, I focused the first decade and a half of my career on delivering those results. And I didn't really do anything around the women's issue, but gradually I became aware that young women, not surprisingly given my large family, would come up and ask for tips on how to combine career and family. And I wanted to help. I wanted to make sure that their path was easier than mine had been. So like many others have done, I set up a women's development network and we held lots of events, sometimes career workshops, sometimes an inspirational speaker. And everyone always said, oh, how inspiring. But to be honest, it didn't seem to inspire anybody to do anything because I became quite disillusioned. A few years into all of that, I looked around and absolutely no difference in the numbers of women making it through and no sign of any breakthrough. Then I was invited to a lunch where there must have been about 15 people there and we were from different, type, quite diverse organisations and everybody was talking about what they were doing to try to encourage women in their careers. And I realised I realized that we were all sort of seeing very little to show for all the effort that we were putting in. I met some great people at that lunch, including someone called Mary Gowdy, and she and I now work very closely together on the 30% Club. And afterwards, we were talking and said, well, you know, we must, we must come up with a new course of action since what we're doing is having such little impact. Now, it did take a while to work out what could be the different uh, way forward. And two ideas occurred to me. One was that we needed a measurable goal with a deadline. Now, we run our businesses with measurable objectives, and that keeps us really focused on trying to deliver them. I'm very anti-mandatory quotas. I believe that you actually have to own something, believe in it, to make change meaningful. And also, frankly, I'm not very interested in seeing just a few token women at the top. I want to see change for many women in many organisations at all levels, and you don't get that from a quota. 30% incidentally is the critical mass number. It's when you're heard as an opinion, not from representing the minority. Obviously, I hope it's just a stepping stone to full parity. The second thing that we needed to do differently was that we needed to involve those in power more. And as I mentioned, the original objective that's much broader now was 30% women on boards. So we needed to involve and have the leadership from the chairman of the boards. So we knew a couple really well. I asked Sir Wynne Bischoff, who was then chairman of Lloyd's Banking Group, and Sir Roger Carr, chairman at the time of Centrica, what they thought of an idea, of the idea of a campaign led by them, or people like them, to really drive this change. And to my relief, as well as my pleasure, both of them immediately said yes. And they said, look, we've seen the difference, the positive impact that having women makes to the boardroom dynamic and to the decision-making process, but there are just too few of them. So we launched a few months later with seven founding chairmen, all men, um, all doing this because they believe it made their businesses better, as well as perhaps paving the way for their daughters. And their evangelism has completely and, and utterly transformed the broader thinking about the issue, because now it's gone from being something that the women are fighting for to something that men want to. And we're now they've turned what was seen as perhaps a bit radical into the norm, and we now have 120 chairman supporters, 90% of them are men, so as an aside, 30% female chairs will be my next goal. Um, but we're making real progress. And then the third ingredient, which I didn't realise at the time, but now with hindsight I recognise as being really um, important, was having an open source collaborative approach. Now, at the time of the launch, there was a lot of criticism, um, including one national newspaper described us as having a very worthy aim, but very vague about how we were going to achieve it. And I now realise that that vagueness was an incredibly important aspect of what happened next. We knew our destination, but we absolutely had to write a new map to get there because the old one wasn't, wasn't working. And of course that meant we had to listen, we had to be open to ideas, we had to evolve as new thinking came about and to, to adapt as we, as we did gain momentum, but also as we encountered challenges. And we also, importantly, went to diversity business, of course. This is just a group of business leaders absolutely determined to see change. So no money changes hands, and all we want to do is work well with people who are already doing great things in this space. There's no sense of competition. And we've had some great collaborations. For example, we work very closely with Lord Davis, 
who was commissioned by the British government to do a cross-party review, which he published in 2011, into why there were so few women on corporate boards in the UK. Again, fantastic to have a man writing that report and advocating business-led change. And many of the collaborations have come from things that we've initiated. Um, one great example was that a number of the managing partners of the professional services firms approached me independently of each other. They said to me, Helena, look, we cannot see whatever we do. We don't seem to be able to get more women through to the partnership. We have, in most of these companies, they have 50% uh, female graduates um, intake, but about 15% at uh, the partnership level. So they said, look, we can't do it individually, but if you bring us together, under the safe harbour of 30% club, then we may be able to solve it together. So more than 20 firms have now been working for several years now on a project which McKinsey has been leading pro bono. Everybody's been incredibly generous. They just want to see the results. Um, and it's been involved some very self-critical um, data, very self-critical sharing of what's really going on, both the, with the women and their expectations of what it would be to be a partner, but also at the men's attitude in, in those firms. But there's a real sense of urgency that I see now, and it's actually starting to bear results. Last year, um, there was a 36% increase in the numbers of female lawyers getting to partnership in the UK. Um, and that's you know, a huge rate of progress over one year. Um, we're going to do a recount this year, and I'm really hopeful that we'll see big change, because those firms recognise if they don't change, they won't be able to attract the best and brightest young men or young women. And we now have 16 intense work streams at the 30% Club, going from schoolroom to the boardroom, so no gap in the career journey. Just this week, we launched a collaboration with Speakers for Schools, which is a fantastic organisation. It was set up by BBC Economics editor Robert Peston. It offers um, state schools free talks by leading business figures and also politicians. And our collaboration, of course, is based on the chairman going into the schools and talking to boys and girls about the importance of valuing each other's differences and also then obviously encouraging girls to consider a wide range of career choices. I'm speaking at a school myself in a couple of days and actually it's a school which is a boys only school until sixth form and then it's mixed from there. It'll be a very interesting discussion with the boys as well as the girls. And then this week as well we launched a pilot of a university survey trying to ascertain what's going on in female students' minds and whether that differs from the male students in terms of their career aspirations. And this is a brainchild of another Helena. Uh, she's called Helena Eccles. She's a current undergraduate at Cambridge. She approached me with the idea. I'm really thrilled that we can implement it with her. Uh, she's definitely one of tomorrow's uh, leaders and it's great to be able to work together. So this approach now of really intense work, it's not a single effort, it's multiple efforts by multiple people across the whole career journey, is now, is now going global. Um, in fact, last year, a US 30% club started. Uh, this was really spearheaded by Peter Grauer, who's chairman of Bloomberg, who has taken the idea and said, yes, I will help get this off the ground. We've got some fantastic initial supporters, including Warren Buffett, including Larry Fink. Again, this is men and women working together. We have a Hong Kong 30% club, um, South Africa. In fact, Ireland launches this week with 85 founding chairman supporters. They've sort of thrown the gauntlet down for any other 30% club uh, chapters around the world. But there's interest from as wider uh, countries as Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, Italy, Poland, the UAE, uh, to name but a few. So this is a really exciting uh, development, and I'm really hopeful it will accelerate change across the world. But to be honest, for me, the most exciting thing is I've realised that the retro boardroom, as I like to describe it now, is actually just a microcosm of the antiquated world of work. And I think we now have an opportunity, a really unusual opportunity, to take what Peter Thiel, the co-founder of PayPal, would call a zero to one leap. I think we can actually move the dial. We're not extrapolating the past. We can change things much more radically. So what the realisation has been, I think, is that um, we have not changed in a quarter of a century uh, the way that we, that we work. We all still pretty much work the way our parents did, at least my generation does. So we take the daily commute, we sit at the same desk, we work traditional, if longer hours, and if people do work flexibly or from home, then that's usually regarded as an employee perk rather than how to get the best out of people. And yet, of course, in that same quarter of a century, we've seen absolutely everything else transform in our lives thanks to globalisation and technology. So, of course, the way we influence, the way we communicate, the way we shop, the way we actually work when we get there. And I think those two trends of globalisation and uh, technology have given rise to a third, and that's the erosion of the traditional hierarchical command and control and, yes, male-oriented power structure. And it leaves an opportunity 
for the rise of more feminine um, power. As my friend and uh, entrepreneur Julie Meyer puts it in her great book, Welcome to Entrepreneur Country. The, the attributes and skills that are needed in a world where, which is built on networks are collaboration, uh, transparency, empathy, uh, being able to build a consensus, all qualities, not just traditionally associated women, with women, but ones which um, current neuroscience suggests that women are naturally hardwired to have a little bit more easy. I'm not saying men can't have them too, but it means that uh, women bring a certain advantage in the way that we work. And this in turn gives rise to the opportunity for us to have our approach to life and behavior uh, move from being a tra perhaps trading at a discount in the world of work, you know, it didn't really fit in with the pattern of, of, uh, that was there before, to being uh, regarded as valuable and trading at a premium. Now, I think this is the real breakthrough. This is the real great news because it means um, that our daughters can and must be themselves at work. They, they need to help create a virtuous circle whereby they are influencing and creating the new business culture. And to be honest, I wouldn't want my daughters to exactly follow in my career path, not just the nine children bit, we would have 81 grandchildren, but, um, <laughs> but also because, you know, I know that I made uh, some compromises along the way. I, I did to fit in with, um, you know, what was the status quo to get that seat at the table, to get that voice. I had to adapt my natural behaviours. And I think the 30% club chairman, although they might not have expressed it this way, they realised, I mean, they weren't just saying, yes, we'll have a few more women just to be nice to the women. They were recognising that this made the boardroom better. And so rebalancing masculine and feminine energies and skills and approaches actually is a better result. I mean, it seems so obvious, really, when one thinks about it like that, doesn't it? Now, this is, to say, the real breakthrough moment. And I think what happens next is really up to all of us. This whole journey so far has been about men and women working together on something. And it is about us being equal, but distinct and different. And it's about not just accepting differences, but welcoming them. And I think they'll say this can go beyond gender. I think now businesses are talking about cognitive diversity as really the, the secret to building a great team. There's this realization that we can really capitalize on. It's great for our daughters, I say, who can build their own journey to work, a uh, journey to the top, but not in the way perhaps that my generation did. Now, so this is a very long way from putting a few more women on corporate boards, but I think it's the real story behind the 30% Club. Thank you.